Okay. Hello, Reddit. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for the long list of questions, and we can't make it through all of them, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, first question is from Kunjan, who asks, which AI field has surpassed your expectations and surprised you the most? And I guess I got to say, machine learning by linear separators uh, has gone much farther than we ever thought it could go. Uh, years ago, people were poo-pooing it as a simple method, but it's turned out to be very powerful. And uh, so, so what does that mean for people who don't know? Well, we got this whiteboard here, and the, the Reddit guys put a bunch of junk on it that's uh, 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 just for show. But uh, what linear separators means is you get some data, and you know you got some positive examples on an xy plot, and some negative examples, and you say let's separate them out by just drawing a line, and then everything above the line is x's, and everything below the lines is o's. And that seems pretty simple because you know what if the data was like this, and there were x's all over the place? Then you can't draw a line to separate out the o's from the x's, but you could draw an ellipse. And the trick was to see that uh, if you're just dealing in the x and y coordinates, there is no uh, linear line that looks like an ellipse. But if you start dealing with the x squared and the, x and the y squared coordinates, then you can do that. And you can get a lot farther than people ever thought you could. Uh, and so that was surprising to me. And I think that the overall lesson is uh, if you keep with a simple representation and push it hard, you can go farther than you thought. Now, the next question, uh, Dear Something asks, I'd like to know the flip side of that. Uh, what do you consider a failure, and uh, should we move further along than it is? And I guess, uh, you know, I hate to call any, any one thing a failure, but related to this, I can say that one thing that uh, hasn't moved this far, uh, and it's also the thing that when I look at the, uh, the difference between the second edition of my textbook and the third edition, it's the chapter that has changed the least, is the chapter on inductive logic programming. And that's the idea of your representation uh, for a function is not a simple line. You know, the line is represented as y equals mx plus b. And to figure out which line, you just figure out what value of m and what value of b. Uh, with inductive logic programming, uh, y is a function of x, and it can be any program uh, written in whatever programming language you choose. And that's proven hard to do. And you know, maybe that's reassuring to us programmers that uh, we're doing something that's difficult for uh, computers to learn automatically. Uh, the simple representation seems to have done better. But I think it's an important field, and I think we should be doing more with it. There definitely has been uh, some advances in recent years, and, and I've been trying to follow that. But that's something we should push harder. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Sarah Brum and also Alexandros were interested in saying, uh, you were a big advocate of LISP. Uh, why isn't it used extensively at Google? I guess the way I look at it is that the best language to use is the one that you and your friends are most productive in. And it just turned out that when Google was started, the, the sort of core programmers uh, that, that were there first were C++ programmers. And they were very effective with that. And they kept going with it. And so part of it is just, I guess, a, a little bit of culture. Uh, do you have the right culture? Now, now given that, of course, you, you can make mistakes. Uh, I th thought it was very telling to read what uh, Ron Gott had to say. And so he was a, an early uh, Googler who had been a Lisp programmer at JPL. He came over to Google before I did. And he said that he was surprised that in his uh, past experience, he had been a Lisp programmer and he has always been more productive than anybody else that he was working with. And he attributed that largely to his language choice. And then he got to Google and he saw C++ programmers that were more productive to him and uh, he was surprised uh, and eventually decided, well, maybe it has more to do with the programmers themselves than with the language choice. So I think we're, we're getting to a point where language choice is less important. Uh, 20 years ago, I think it was more important because there were uh, languages were more impoverished and Lisp had quite an advantage. Now the features are tending to even out. And I guess the other aspect is I think uh, Lisp is really optimized for uh, optimized for a small uh, group, a single programmer, or a small group of programmers doing exploratory work. Uh, and that's great. And if you want to refactor something in a weekend, uh, I'd rather be doing it in Lisp than anything else. But by the time you get up to hundreds of programmers, the problem of doing a complete refactorization is not so much that the language is stopping you from making the changes. 
the problems are more social of how do you communicate with the other 100 or 200 or 2,000 programmers and say, I want to make this change. Does that change affect you? And so again, uh, kind of language choice becomes less important. OK. Uh, oh, and I guess one other thing is that uh, for whatever reason, uh, the various sets of libraries for web protocols and other things have been slower to develop in Lisp than they have in other languages. And so people go where the rich library sets are. Uh, next question from Lizard. In which projects are you personally strongly involved right now? And tying into this, can you describe your individual typical day at Google for us uh, with an emphasis on what kinds of tasks you're mainly handling? So my main personal project right now is around uh, search for educational material. And uh, I just did a textbook, and so I'm uh, interested in college-level courses. How do you find material related to that? And there's a lot of great material out there. We're also interested in K-12 education and in kind of personal ad hoc uh, learning for hobbyists or makers or whatever uh, to learn a specific task. Uh, and we're interested in this at the level of uh, finding materials that's already out there, uh, organizing material to say, I want to put together a specific course. Can I find the pieces and paste them together into a course? Uh, providing tools for authors, teachers to uh, do that. And then also in this question of what is it like when your search experience uh, and your learning experience lasts over a semester or months or years, rather than just the very quick interaction that we're used to, where you do one search at a time and, and get the answers. Uh, so that's what I'm personally interested in. What do I do in my typical day? Well, part of it is, is spent on that project. Uh, part of it is spent in meetings with the uh, various teams that I oversee, uh, trying to get up to date and talk about what they're doing and maybe make some connections for them with uh, other projects they might be working with. And of course, like everyone else, uh, a lot of my day is answering email. Next question from uh, CryptoZ. Is Google working on strong AI? Uh, well, so the first part is to define what the question means. And uh, John Searle, who's a philosopher, he was there at Berkeley when I was there, uh, defined the term strong AI versus weak AI. And he said that uh, Weak AI is when something looks like it's intelligent or thinking or conscious. And strong AI is when it actually is. Uh, and he wanted to make that distinction. And he says, well, people actually are conscious or intelligent. Uh, but he thought that a computer, even if it looked like it did, uh, probably wouldn't be really uh, have that and so wouldn't be strong. Uh, and my reaction to that is, who cares? Uh, you know, I guess philosophers have got to have something to do. but. I'm not going to base uh, my decision on uh, whether they think it's real or not. And uh, uh, Edgar Dijkstra had this uh, line of, of saying uh, the questions of whether a computer can think is equivalent to the question of whether a submarine can swim. And uh, if you're a, uh, a naval engineer, you don't really care whether the philosophers tell you that your submarines are swimming or not. Uh, you just want to make them go. Uh, so that definition of strong AI, I don't care about. Uh, but now there's been a new definition, and people have taken this perfectly good, well-defined term and redefined it to mean uh, strong AI means uh, general human-level intelligence. So being able to solve uh, any task at all at the level of a human does, as opposed to the very specific intelligence where you can do one thing, like play chess or uh, recognize faces in a photograph or whatever. Uh, and I think that, that's interesting, and certainly we should have some people working on that. Uh, but I think we're still at a, at a phase where we don't know how to do it. Uh, and the analogy I like to make is, is saying, uh, well, is NASA working on interplanetary travel? And one answer is no, because there are no planned interplanetary flights. Uh, but the other answer is, well, they're working on specific components. They're working on solar sails and ion engines and other things that may eventually get us to interplanetary travel once we figure out how it's possible. And I think it's the same thing with AI, is that we need more pieces. We need more components that we know work. And then eventually somebody will be able to say, let's put them all together. And so I'm glad that most of the people are working on the components. And I'm also glad that there are some people who are thinking about how to put it all together but we're not there yet to know how to do it. Okay, 
P. Sestrada asks, how do you approach a difficult programming problem? And I, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> you, you just go ahead and do it and, and hope that you get the answer. Uh, and you can think about a lot of different strategies. Uh, so uh, look to see if there are similar problem has been solved before by somebody else or, or, or by me. Uh, you can try to solve a, a simpler problem first. Take a piece of it and see if that gives you some ideas. Uh, Sometimes even try a more difficult problem, saying, can you generalize this and then prove something about that generalization and attack that problem. Uh, you can talk to a bunch of people, see what ideas they have, uh, see if they have something that helps. Uh, you can try to collect more data to make the problem easier or, or make it go away. Uh, you can finesse the problem by getting somebody else to do it. You can build a social community to uh, do the work for you, uh, for the parts of the work that you can't do yourself. Uh, and I, guess, I guess it occurs to me that a lot of these strategies you can see in uh, Polya's How to Solve It, which is a book about mathematics, not about programming problems. But it's really a question of uh, when you get stuck, what do you do to jog your mind a little bit and get in a different direction? Um, and I think we still don't know the answer of, of what the best way to do that is. OK. Uh, obsessed with AMAS or AMAS or something like that asks, why are we still so bad at software development? Uh, I guess I would disagree. I, I think we're actually pretty good at software development, and I think it's just really hard. Uh, so to know if we're good or bad, you have to compare it to something. Uh, and you know, one thing we commonly gets compared to is civil engineering. And uh, bridges don't fall down that often. Uh, but they sometimes do. Uh, programs seem to crash a lot more than bridges do. But, uh, but if you look at the relative efforts and the customization, uh, then the bridge designers have it a lot easier because they're building one bridge at a time in a specific place, and they know exactly how much current is going by and how much wind and uh, what the soil is like underneath and so on. Uh, and they build that one solution, whereas uh, Software engineers, uh, we build a solution, and then we ship it to 100 million people, and they're all in slightly different environments uh, that we don't get to look at ahead of time. So I think for the level of difficulty of the problem, I think we're actually doing pretty good. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, and for some of those 100 millions, you'll ship into an environment where it doesn't work, where there'll be a conflict with DLLs or you know, it'll work over time, and then some networking standard will get updated, and it will stop working. Uh, so there's going to be lots of problems. Uh, but I don't think any other uh, discipline knows how to do that significantly better, because I think they're solving uh, simpler problems. Uh, now, certainly, if we could do, if we could have software that does what the civil engineers do, uh, then we'd have a much more reliable system, and we're not there yet. So what, what do the civil engineers do? Well, they say, there's some standard approach to building a bridge, but now on this specific site, you know, what are the, the real problems to deal with? Well, maybe the, uh, the soil is a little bit shifty, and so we have to build the tower deeper into the ground than we would normally. Uh, and software doesn't do that very well. So you have some capability to configure software to your specific machine, but you really want it to be proactive. You want it to have the discussion that the civil engineers would have of saying, hey, I got deployed in this environment. What's the hard part of this environment? Oh, here's this tricky interaction. Now I'm going to reconfigure myself to solve that problem and, and make it go away. And so if software can do that, then we'll, re we'll really be as reliable as all these other disciplines, uh, but still uh, won't need the customization. OK. Next question. Uh, Runtime asks, how do you think languages will evolve to tackle many core processors? And do you think any of the current paradigms Writing with locks, STM, pure functional, actor model, GPU parallelism with SIMD of uh, multi-threaded development will scale to handle them. Well, I guess I have uh, a different approach to looking at it. So to, to me, uh, many core is not the problem because I'm used to starting from the point of view that the computational unit is a data center. So it's already got thousands of CPUs and uh, whether the individual boards have one or eight or 128 uh, cores on them, uh, that's not going to add to the complexity too much. So we already need an approach that's parallel at that very large scale. 
And, and yes, there is uh, going to be a difference at every level. There's a difference uh, if you miss, miss the cash. There's a difference if you go to another uh, core on board. There's a difference if you go to another board on the rack or if you go to another machine uh, across racks and which switches you're going across. You have to worry about all those levels of distances. Uh, but in another sense, it's solving the same problem with, with uh, different constants involved with them. Uh, and certainly, if you're thinking at the level of these thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of parallel computations, then probably this manual keeping track of uh, threads with locks is not going to scale very well. So what we really need is uh, closer to the functional type approach, something where we have the right abstractions to make this all work. And uh, you know, Google's well known for having this map reduce abstraction. Uh, when we first introduced it, we said, well, here's one that we know is really going to work really well. And there's probably going to be a dozen different abstractions, but let's do this one first. And then I think it kind of surprised us that it went a lot farther than, than we thought it should go. Uh, but I think it is time to look back and say, well, what are the next dozen abstractions that are like that, that allow you to break problems up into pieces and combine them back together again? We have uh, a few ways of combining them together. I think there should be more. And you want to uh, have ways where you, uh, the program kind of declaratively understands the commutativity and associativity of the problem and how it can be broken up into pieces and how it can be assembled back together. And we probably need a few better abstractions for dealing with that. Uh, and then we'll be in good shape. Uh, now, of course, this is all from the point of view of various of different types of computations. This fits well for the, type, or for the web type of computations where you have a lot of data and you're doing the same thing mostly to different pieces and then summarizing them and combining them. For other types of computations, you're going to need different types of abstractions. Okay, uh, Kafra asks, with your big emphasis on data over algorithms, uh, vastly successful as it's been, I have to wonder, is there a point of diminishing returns in collecting data where it's once again worthwhile to spend your time trying to make a clever algorithm instead. How do you recognize that point? OK. Uh, well, that's pretty easy. Uh, one way to recognize it is you just uh, plot it. So uh, you, know, you make a graph of here's the amount of data you collect, and here's the performance. And you get more data, and the performance goes up. And at some point, it begins to asymptote out. And then you say, well, probably I don't want any more of the same kind of data. It's just starting to slow me down and not gaining me much. Of course, you could always go back and say, uh, is there other data that I'm missing? Is there a different type of data that I want? And uh, in some sense, that means that you're inventing a new algorithm. Uh, so you, should, you could do that. That's an easy approach. And then you can also say, am I looking at the, the whole problem wrong? Is there a completely different approach that I should be taking? And that's where you have to, to start getting clever again. OK. And uh, G-Sharm, or maybe G-S-Harm, asks, uh, from your research at Google, what have you found to produce an environment most conductive to programming? Are cubicles as effective as closed offices? Is a 10-inch netbook as effective in the hands of a good programmer as fast multi-core Mac Pro with three 30-inch monitors? In your view, should employers give more serious consideration to working conditions and equipment of increasingly well-paid programmers? So I think that's a great question. And that's, that's actually one that I was interested in, in doing studies for. I think we, we have enough programmers now that we can do that kind of uh, experiment in-house. Uh, you're starting to see a little bit of it. I think uh, as a field, there's been far too little of this. We really don't know. Uh, you know the programmers tell you what they want. Uh, but there haven't been these good scientific studies to say what works or what doesn't work. Uh, I certainly have seen uh, studies that say that having big monitors is better. Uh, I don't know if those studies were uh, sponsored by the monitor manufacturers, so I don't know how much I trust them. You, want, you do want to see a couple of them before you uh, really trust them. Uh, cubicles versus closed offices. Uh, well, you know, it's just sort of the way buildings are designed. You, you normally end up with both. I, I think at Google, the question is more uh, how many people are in your office. And some companies take the point of view that for a programmer, concentration is the most important thing. 
And so every programmer gets a private office. And Google has taken the point of view that communication is, is more important. And so we try to put uh, a whole team together in an office. So you're working with two or three or four people, and they're all right there. And hopefully the talk that goes back and forth is uh, talk that everybody should know. And so it's not so much interrupting your concentration as it is keeping you aware of what's going on. And there's always a trade-off there. I remember we, uh, we had a, we would do an annual survey of things that people like and don't like and, uh, you know, everything from is the cafeteria food good to are the chairs comfortable or is your back hurting you to are the uh, uh, compilers fast enough and everything else. And the, uh, the number one thing that people appreciated most out of all the 50 or 100 questions was the quality of their colleagues. And so I, I thought that was a great answer. And the question that people uh, thought was the worst was being interrupted by somebody asking a question. So, so we've determined that the perfect place is one where I can ask a question of anybody else, but nobody can ask a question of me. Uh, but we haven't quite figured out how to implement that yet. Uh, so you, you want to have the right trade-off. You want to have uh, ways of people uh, to signal that they need uh, privacy. And uh, headphones seem to work pretty well for that. People uh, put on the headphones, and then you know you don't want to interrupt them. Uh, sometimes people take their laptops and go off someplace so they can be private. Or if they want to have a conversation just one-on-one -on -one with some other person, you go and grab them and you go sit someplace else. Uh, but I think we need, we need a lot more research to know how you trade these things off. OK, uh, human check. To verify you are a human and not an AI bot, please quickly answer the following. Uh, do you still play uh, Frisbee golf? And if yes, what is your typical score? And so, so sadly, I haven't really been playing uh, very much uh, uh, seriously. I, I like to go out in the backyard and throw things around, but I haven't been competing the way I did in the past. What magazines and books do you read? Uh, well, I'm told the best answer for that is all of them, all, all the fine magazines and books I, I read. Uh, but I guess the, the last book I read was the uh, Checkmark Manifesto, which is about uh, or a checklist manifesto, which is about the idea of uh, using checklists in surgery. And this uh, doctor determined that uh, patients were getting infected because doctors were spreading disease because they were forgetting to wash their hands. And if you have a simple checklist that says, wash your hands, then infections go down. And so it's interesting to sort of apply that. Uh, are there simple things we can do in software development uh, uh, where we can learn from that? And for the most part, I think we do a good job. We're probably better at doing tests than most people. Uh, but uh, that's something to look at. And so mostly I read uh, kind of uh, nonfiction and science-oriented, uh, science, science news, uh, discovery, and uh, new scientists, and so on. Have you found a use for Google Wave? Uh, I played with it a little bit. I think the, the problem right now it, is that uh, not everyone is on it, so it's harder to communicate with. Uh, I think one of the killer apps for Google Wave is to uh, discard all the legacy mailing lists that you're on that are no good anymore. So anytime you move to a new platform, you can just throw away all the old stuff and start over again. So I think that's great and it's exciting to move to something new. Uh, what's your favorite game? Uh, I guess Ultimate Frisbee is still my, still my favorite, uh, even though I don't get a chance to play as much as I used to. And finally, how do you feel? I feel good. I knew it I would. Uh, let's see. Uh, no Theory asks, what's the relationship between research and production code at Google? How do research projects move into production? Uh, and that's pretty interesting, because I, I think it's different at Google than it is in, in many organizations uh, that have a, uh, a more strict uh, distinction between uh, research and engineering. And Google, uh, despite the size that it's at, still operates uh, mostly as a startup. And you know, in a startup, you, you have a bunch of PhDs, but you don't stick them off in a separate building and call them researchers. It's sort of everybody is there contributing together, and uh, people do what needs to be done without really questioning it. And uh, Google still pretty much has that feel. So there's, there's not that much of a distinction between being a researcher 
versus being an engineer. Everybody pitches in. Uh, and it's much easier for a research project to make it into production. I think part of the reason for that is because it starts out so much closer to production. Uh, you know, in academia and in some other research labs, uh, you know, a researcher gets an idea, codes something up on their laptop, and then they've got a prototype. But how are you going to harden that prototype and get it into production? Well, you really have to throw it out and start over. At Google, part of the point of being here is that there is all this data available. And in order to take advantage of it, you can't load it onto your laptop. It wouldn't fit. So right from the start, the researchers are writing code that use our main APIs that are using the data that everybody else uses. You know, you, if you want some web pages, you use the full copy of the web. If you want some uh, link data, you use the full link graph and so on. And you use it in the uh, uh, data centers. And so that makes it a lot easier to go from there to launch something. Now you still may, you know, the prototype may run 10 times too slow to be effective. So there may be a big re-engineering job to get it to launch. Uh, but at least you're a couple steps closer. And, and there certainly are examples uh, where Google has gone from a research project uh, to production code and kept the whole thing in research. And I think that's kind of unique. So we've kept, uh, for example, the speech recognition and the machine translation, which started as research projects. But then rather than handing them off to an engineering team when they were ready to go, we said, uh, we don't want to split up the team. We don't want to have one half that's running a production system and one half that's trying to build the next system. We want to keep it together. And we'll keep it together inside research. So we brought production engineers into research to help the research team. And they're simultaneously maintaining the current system and trying to update the next one. Uh, questions for Reddit. I guess, uh, uh, do, as, a, as a community, do you feel that Reddit is getting what you want? Uh, you know, so is this experiment of saying, we're just going to vote things up, is this finding what you want? Is it getting you the things that are appropriate for you? Is it casting a net that's wide enough or, or too wide? Uh, and if not, uh, is there a way to change the rules to make it better? 